Uh, just as a reminder, homework six was posted. So it's available. If you grabbed it right away, go back and get it again, because about 40 minutes after I posted it, I realized your book violated conservation of mass on one of its statements. So I had to fix that. Uh, one of the numbers has to go from five to 10, uh, and that was updated. So if you grabbed it like within 20 minutes of using that um, email about it being posted, go grab it again, because one of the problems now has a uh, clarification on it. The deadline for that I, was said somewhere in that email, but I only moved it back about a day because I also cut two of the problems off of it. Um, so there's less there to do, so I think it'll still be okay. Uh, and those of you with your extension still get your extension for that to move it back um, by one day. So homework six is available. Also the projects, um, I also sent out an email on those. You're good to go. We don't have anything else to go over for the projects. Uh, except the very last problem, one part of that problem requires what's called a Levenspiel plot that we haven't gone over yet. Uh, we will get to that. It's a really easy plot to make. You've got more than enough to keep you busy if you want to start on it now. You don't have to wait for the Levenspiel stuff. Um, and if you're so interested, you can just look it up. It takes like two minutes to learn what a Levenspiel plot is. Um, so yeah, you've got plenty to go for your uh, project. I also talked with um, Dr. Safari. He already let one person come over here to work on one of our projects with some of our students. So since we let one person do it, we kind of have to let everybody do it. So we are rescinding our previous restriction about not working across sections. So you can work across sections um, if you want to. Just pick one of the sections problem statements because they are subtly different. Uh, I don't care which one you pick. Actually, I do care. Go pick Dr. Safari's, because then I have less to grade when I'm done. Um, so the first, like, maybe 20 minutes of this lecture is just going to be math. So let's review a little bit of um, math. Maybe it's not math. I don't know what you would call it. I'm going to call it math, because it doesn't have anything to do with reaction engineering in particular, or even chemical engineering. It's a useful tool to have. It's kind of like differential equations. Um, but the general topic is how do we solve a nonlinear equation? We're not going to worry at the moment about solving multiple nonlinear equations. That is a problem when you do have multiple reactions. Sometimes you have to solve multiple nonlinear equations. Um, we're just going to worry about solving one of them. There's several different ways to solve. Um, a nonlinear equation, but the first thing you have to start with is a nonlinear equation. Um, sometimes they will come to you in different forms. The most general form um, is the old chocolate and vanilla of math, uh, g of x and f of x. Or I think um, the computer scientist people call them Alice and Bob, but math people call them f and g. Right, just two general functions of x, whatever they happen to be, and they're set equal to each other. And so a problem statement for something like this would be solve for x. Whatever x happens to be. The interesting thing about nonlinear equations that usually shows up here and doesn't show up in a linear equation um, is that there could be multiples. So you could have more than one solution here. The classic example of that is like your quadratic equation, um, where you've got um, two solutions, and you do the little plus minus square root for something minus something else. Um, most of the time, the equations that we're going to solve will not be quadratic equation or second order polynomials, and therefore you cannot use the quadratic equation. They're going to be more general than that, and so we need a more general approach to solving these. More importantly than that, to just solve it and get a value of x, how do we figure out whether or not we've got just a single solution or multiple solutions? Um, that's a little trickier. T time. So what are some of the approaches? Let's see, approach one. <coughs> approach one is to plot g of x and f of x together. If you plot them together, the intersections are the solutions.
if you have more than one intersection, then you have more than one solution. So for example, if you have a plot like this, and you put x down here, put both g of x and f of x on the same y-axis, uh, and wherever these two interact, or intersect, I should say, let's make this one a different color. We'll make that one f of x. So if f of x does something like this, and g of x does that, this is the solution. Right, wherever they intersect at that particular point, that's the value that you have for a solution. A plot like this is useful because if there are multiple intersections, it should be relatively apparent. Um, however, it will only be apparent if your X range is large enough, right? If your X range is short, then you might not see it. So G of X again, was that, yeah, F of X. So if G of X looks like that, or sorry, F of X looks like that, and G of X looks like that, I now have two intersection points here and here. Both of these are solutions. We've kind of seen that before. If you use a quadratic equation, right, we always get two solutions out of the quadratic equation. Sometimes you dump one of those solutions because it has whatever we refer to as non-physical meaning. So maybe you get a temperature that's imaginary or a temperature that's negative or something like that. Um, and we can just discard that solution because it has no physical meaning. I don't know what a non-physical temperature refers to. It might refer to something. Um, but at any rate, you just have to use your own best judgment to decide which of those are the actual solutions. Sometimes it won't be so obvious. So for example, you could get two temperatures that are both perfectly reasonable. Maybe they're 350 and 400 K, something like that. Uh, and you'd have to evaluate other parameters inside your solution to decide whether they're reasonable or not. For example, one of those temperatures could give a conversion of more than 100% or less than 0%, something like that. And you would check that temperature too because it doesn't correspond to anything physical. But the search in general for these intersections um, can be facilitated by a plot like this. You, the only requirement if you're going to use a plot like this is make this range Uh, big enough. So this range should be big enough. And I got to put that in quotes because there's no way to know ahead of time what big enough really means. You just try it for a couple of ranges and see if anything interesting is happening anywhere else. Um, for example, if you started off with a small range on top and went to a larger range on the bottom, then you would see a multiple solution. Um, but there's no, there's not really even a good way to guess what a big range and a small range is other than your own intuition. If it's something like temperature, then it's reasonable because you pick, you know, the lower bound can't be less than zero, and the upper bound is usually no more than like a thousand or something like that. Um, and so you can plot everything over a pretty good range. So that's one option is to just plot the two, look for the intersections. Another option, which is related, uh, is to put in what's called root finding form. I'll put that in quotes. Root finding form. The root finding form of any nonlinear equation that we had, like we saw a minute ago, is to just put everything on one side. So for example, f of x minus g of x would be our example. If we had to take that f of x is equal to g of x and rearrange it. It also doesn't matter which way that you do something like that. So this could equally be g of x minus f of x. That will have no impact at all on the solution. It'll make the plots look a little bit different if you have to plot them, but it does not change at all the actual solution because that's just multiplying by minus one all the way through. If you put it in um, root finding form like this, this is actually the, <clears throat> excuse me, the equation that all of your solvers will use. So if you're using your calculator to solve one of these equations, it's actually using an algorithm designed to do this. Um, MATLAB does this, uh, Excel does this, almost anything that's trying to solve a nonlinear equation puts it in this form even if you don't see it put in that form. Um, the reason is the algorithms are pretty well simplified if you're just trying to find a root around zero instead of a root around a number. A root, by the way, is the solution. I'll just. Add that here. When we say the word root, that's a math term. 
that means the solution. So if you have it in root finding form, you can again plot this as a function of x. But what you're plotting is not f of x and g of x, but it's f of x minus g of x. So you can either plot f of x minus g of x, or if you had rearranged it the other way around, then g of x minus f of x. Right? You plot either one of those quantities, uh, and they might do something like that. And so now you're not looking for the intersection between necessarily two curves. You're looking for points on that curve that are equal to 0. Points on that curve that are equal to 0 satisfy that either one of those equations up at the top. So there's often another curve that's added to these plots, uh, even if it's not explicitly required, which is the line at 0. So it's just a horizontal line. It's supposed to be a horizontal line. Uh, at zero. And so you look for intersections between those. And so I have one intersection here and one intersection here. These are my what would be termed roots in math, but those are generally your solutions. Pretty much the same thing as the other one. Um, again, most of the automated tools that you'll ever use will be solving it in some way like this. Uh, if f of x and g of x have some physical meaning to them, like they can be associated with something happening in your energy balance or your material balance, then maybe this form is better because you can actually see g of x and f of x. If you don't care, you're just trying to find a solution, um, this one is also fine. Um, you can use either one of those um, and they'll both get the job done. These plotting techniques are pretty helpful when you've got exceptionally complicated um, equations that don't really lend themselves to typing into your calculator. Uh, so you can load all these equations into MATLAB and then just plot all of these functions over a very large range and use your cursor just like you did with ODE 4.5 and get the approximate location of any of those intersections. Um, and that's fine. The third option, if you don't want to do either of these, uh, is to use a tool. The tool that you're going to use depends on the, the piece of hardware that you want to use. If you're going to use, um, for example, MATLAB on a computer, the tool that you would use is called F0, which we already um, talked about, at least very briefly in terms of the project. It can be useful for the project. It can also be useful for these CSTR problems. The syntax for F0 uh, is something like at x f of x. So that looks similar to that handle kind of notation that we had used for ODE 4.5, except it was at v comma y and then ODE function of v y. Here it's just at f, uh, at x f of x. You need one other piece, which is um, a guess. The guess that you provide here is a guess for um, the root location. And again, the root is just another word for the solution. So for example, if you're trying to solve some nonlinear equation for temperature, you have to give it a guess for the temperature of where you think that temperature will be. It can generally be a pretty sloppy guess. You don't have to get it particularly close. If you're with, generally within about 100 degrees, um, it'll find it without too much of a problem. Um, if you want to use uh, TI-89 has a function called solve. And the syntax for solve in your TI-89 is something like 0 equals whatever function of x you have. And then you tell it to solve for x. The solve function in a TI-89, I'm not, I don't think TI-83s have these. So this is a TI-89. I think anything above an 83 has a solve function. Does anybody have anything above an 83 that has solve? What kind do you have? Um, TI-inspire. TI-inspire, and it's got a solve function in it? OK, its syntax is almost guaranteed to be the same. It's the same? OK, perfect. So for example, a TI-89 has that. Um, 
if you want to find out if yours has it, just Google around a little bit. If your calculator does not have it, try to find like a used one. Uh, maybe don't buy a new one because I think for some reason they're still like $200. Uh, but that's a useful function to have. Uh, the other syntax that you could have if you want to use a spreadsheet program on something like um, Google Sheets or Excel uh, is a function called GoalSeek. Or sometimes they call it Solver. There's not really a syntax for those. You'll just have to look it up based on whatever software platform you want to use. Um, so these are for spreadsheets. I mean, there is a syntax for them, but there's no syntax that I can provide on here because it's more of a graphical user interface. You select what you want to change until something else is equal to some other value. Um, I guess I need to label the top one up here as well. This is MATLAB. It's useful, I think, if you know the MATLAB one um, because most of the other stuff is put in MATLAB anyway, so it's very easy to quickly generate plots and look for intersections and all that and then call something like F0 um, to try to solve it within MATLAB. But all of these tools are uh, more or less dependent on um, the nonlinear equation having at least one solution. How do you know if it has one? So for example, let's say you're getting an error in TI-89 for solve and it says there are no solutions. How do you know if you messed up the equation or if it really doesn't have any solutions? Usually that comes from either something like step two where you actually, or um, option two where you plot it like this or option one where you plot it like that. These are the go-to places to begin when you're starting these um, types of problems, when you're looking for the solutions, um, is to just plot them and find out where those solutions lie and if they're present or not. I can't think of any other useful uh, uh, ways that come up particularly often um, if I'm trying to solve a nonlinear equation. These are pretty much the only ones that I've ever seen used. If you've got something else, it probably works. Um, I just don't know of any other ones. None of these, by the way, uh, F, I would never ask on an exam anything that requires use of one of these in order to solve something. So I might have you set up an equation and not solve it. Um, or if I need you to be able to solve it, it will be, you know, at most a quadratic um, polynomial that you can put then into the quadratic equation, uh, which also, I don't remember the quadratic equation, so I don't expect you to remember the quadratic equation. Um, so I would give you that if you needed the quadratic equation. Any questions on any of these approaches? Because we're going to look at basically examples for the rest of the class today, tomorrow, and the following day. Friday, I'll try to put together um, an in-class activity so you don't have to just watch me doing this. Um, we can kind of work together on those stuff, try and get... I think we've had two bonuses for exam one, but only one for exam two. So I'll try to make that one work for bonus for exam two on Friday. But any questions on these approaches um, before we take a look at what they mean for a CSTR instead of something else? That's my excuse for tea time. Nada? Okay, cool. I assume you know how to do it then. Let's look at an example for a CSTR. We will learn why these things are interesting. We gave the full energy balance um, yeah, uh, Monday for the CSTR. I think we hadn't mentioned, did we get all the way through the energy balance? Somewhere in your notes from Monday, do we have the energy? I would have like boxed it or something like that. And then I think we had looked at the adiabatic version, right? Okay, we did make it that far. Good, I'm not losing my mind. Um, so I'll just take a brief moment too to indicate one of the terms that's on there. So how do you jacket a CSTR? Um, first of all, don't put your piping through your jacket because that can be difficult. So you could, for example, feed your reactants in this way. Uh, and you could take your reactants out by putting a little pipe down into here. Oh, an aside. I just learned about a really neat level measurement tool. There's a level measurement tool. Don't add this to your drawing. I'm going to use this drawing because we just drew it. 
So what, uh, there's a level measurement tool, and what the level measurement tool does is it pushes air in through a little tube like this down into a vat, uh, and it measures the amount of pressure necessary to get bubbles to come out of the other side, and that's all it does. And that measures the, the, the back pressure on that is proportional to the height of the liquid level in there, and as long as it's making bubbles, it knows what the height is, which I think is super clever because you can put it down into really caustic, really nasty solutions without having to actually put anything other than a tube down in there. Uh, that was a bubble height indicator that I just learned about probably a week ago. Uh, completely unrelated to CSTRs, but we just drew it. So Anyway, your output could be over here. How do you get that out? Uh, you'd need a pump or something on it. So all of your inlets are going to be coming in over here. Your outlets are going to be coming in over here. Remember, all of the uh, characterization, all of the properties of your outlet are the same as the properties inside the actual CSTR. That was our well-mixed assumption that we had made for a CSTR. Um, so that also eliminated all of our differential equations. And then there's probably some kind of a little mixer sitting in there, uh, which is agitating your material. So how do you jacket something like this? The jacket looks actually very similar to the jacket that you would have for a batch reactor. Um, it would just go around the CSTR like this. So you could have coolant going in this way, TA, and coolant going out this way. You can do all the same tricks that we did for plug flow reactors in terms of looking at the energy balance for the jacket. It doesn't, there is no distinction between co-flow and counterflow for one of these, uh, the same way there was no distinction for co-flow and counterflow for a batch reactor. So that does simplify the, the jacket case quite a bit um, for something like this. I don't know why, but almost all examples for CSTRs just assume constant TA. Um, we don't really worry about the energy balance on the uh, jacket for a CSTR. No idea why not. Nothing wrong with doing something like that. It works exactly the same as uh, the energy balance that we have for a PFR. The area that we need, so remember the Q hasn't changed. It'll still look like minus UA T minus TA. So this area here looks like if you flip way back in your notes to when we had done, done this for um, a batch reactor, the area that we were talking about was this area here. So we basically just need to know how big is our batch reactor. If it's a cylinder, we would get you know, the area of all of the walls and maybe the bottom cap or something like that. Uh, but the reason we're interested in that particular area um, is because that's where energy typically leaves our uh, reacting fluid and enters our coolant, or vice versa. If we're heating something up, we can get Q to go in through there. So A is, again, that area available for heat transfer. It's just an actual area, uh, not the little lowercase a, like for a plug flow or pack bed, because we don't have any differentials here. We don't need to know a differential area. We just need to know the total area. So that's what a Q looks like for this particular system. The reason you don't push a pipe through your jacket is because, A, you'll have to pay a lot for it because it costs a lot to go through a jacket. Uh, and B, it tends to lead to leaks because you have multiple seals that have to separate now coolant and reactant flow. Um, so we just generally don't push through a jacket. Yeah? Is it Q with respect to the reactor or with respect to the coolant jacket? Uh, either one. So the only difference is whether or not it's T minus TA. That's for the reactants. If it's TA minus T, then that's for the jacket. But the, uh, so what this is saying is the amount of energy moving from one place to the other is Q. And so the sign dictates whether or not you're sort of taking the view of the reactants or the view of the jacket. It's not a convention like you normally write Q in terms of the reactor. Yeah, so this follows the same convention that we had for the other two reactors, which is if energy is going into the system, then it's positive. That was derived with that um, convention involved, which is actually a really good point. Don't forget, conventions change from field to field. 
I've never seen a different convention for reaction engineering, but if you go to mechanical engineering or something like that, they may have the opposite convention, and you would just have to check what it is. Yeah? Uh, it's an actual area. So this one would have, for example, units of meters squared. Uh, and U is separate. So U is still our heat transfer coefficient. And this will have units of something like watt per meter squared per Kelvin. So they're, they're isolated. The little a is also separate, too. That, it, that is not a subscript. Yeah? Oh, I'm sorry. They should all be Q dot. Just one is in terms of time and one is not. So if you don't have the dot, that typically represents just like a joule or something like that that got added to it. If it's got a dot, then it's more like a joule per second. The reason we've got a dot here is if you look on your uh, U, it's got units of watts per meter squared per Kelvin, and a watt is a joule per second, so it's got a unit of time involved. Was there one other question up there somewhere? No? OK. Let's see anything. So what would a typical problem statement look like for one of these? It's kind of atypical, um, but not terribly unusual. Coming in, well, actually, let's define the reaction first. We'll have a reaction. I'm going to try to make all of these about as simple as possible. So we're not going to have to do any unit conversions. They're all just going to work out on their own. Um, so it's kind of artificial in that sense. But that's just so that we don't have to worry about doing a lot of conversions. We'll have A goes to B. Um, it'll be elementary. That's right. That, or that's convenient, right? An elementary first order reaction that's irreversible. That's about as easy as we can get. Uh, the delta H for this, we'll have it be exothermic. So I'm just going to pick a number like 100 kilojoules per mole just to make our lives, actually, we don't have to. We could allow that to vary, um, but we're not going to, because we're going to let CP of A be the same as CP of B. And we're going to set both of those equal to 30. Those will be joules per mole Kelvin. So that effectively sets our delta H as constant, because the only reason delta H wouldn't be constant uh, is if the delta CP term that modifies it is not zero. Here we've got a one-to-one -one stoichiometry and an equal um, heat capacity for both of them. So that term delta CP will be equal to zero. Since that's equal to zero, that also means that this delta H is constant. Uh, and then we'll have a rate coefficient, or sorry, excuse me, rate constant. So that's a lowercase k of 0 0.001 per second. And that'll be at 300 k. Since we often need to modify k for different temperatures, we'll also give an activation energy of 50 kilojoules per mole. Pretty standard stuff. The, the specifications for CSTR don't really look that much different from the specifications for um, a plug flow reactor or a pack bed or a batch or anything like that. So about the only other thing that we need to do is specify what's coming in. This is all reaction data that's um, true regardless of what the reactor is. The stuff coming in, we're only going to be worried about A and B. There will be no inert. So the initial amount of A coming in will be one mole per second. B will be zero. That's always nice. Uh, it will come in at a volumetric flow rate little v zero of one liter per second. And it'll come in at a temperature T zero of 325 Kelvin. So again, that's you know, kind of nice. We've only got one thing coming in. We've got a bunch of ones everywhere, so that's nice. I'm going to erase this Q because we need a little bit more room over here. The coolant temperature that we have, TA, 
we'll assume that that is um, constant so that we don't really have to uh, worry about it anymore. The TA that we have, where did I put the TA? Oh, 325. And the area available for heat transfer will be 0 0.3 meters squared. Who knows what that is? I don't know if it's a cylinder or not. This is why these problems take so long, right? It's been like seven minutes and we haven't even defined all of the variables that we need yet. The overall heat transfer coefficient, which by the way, these numbers, if you're specifically designing a heat exchanger, are typically on the order of about 1,000. Um, they can be much lower or much higher, uh, depending on what your fluids are. So if you're trying to transfer energy to a gas, these things are typically very low. Um, but between liquids, they're usually pretty high. They're around 1,000, something like that. Uh, yes, thank you. TA is constant. We're not going to worry about that. Very last thing we need to know is how big is the reactor. Um, this reactor will be one liter. Where can I put one liter? I guess here. Uh, let me erase a little bit inside of our reactor here to make it a little bit more clear. It's a one liter reactor. Go ahead and do that on your notes. I know all of you can erase it like that. It's like eight minutes for a problem statement. Fortunately, it's, it's not. There shouldn't really be anything in here that looks particularly intimidating, particularly scary, because it's all very, it should be very familiar from the plug flow, pack bed, batch reactor stuff. For example, uh, if we look down here, we know how to use that information, right? We've got a K and an EA, so we know we can scale the K with any temperature that we need. That's why the EA is there. This kind of stuff. Those are all going to go towards our Q dot. So that's basically just enough information that we know everything for Q dot except the temperature T. Uh, all of the elementary um, rate law stuff that we have there should look pretty familiar. The delta H is nice and simple. Um, and then there's nothing particularly unusual about the left-hand side. So don't let the quantity of information that comes along with these problems be somehow overwhelming. Um, just start writing all of it down. It should look somewhat similar to the plug flow pack bed stuff, especially by the time that you've already gone through all these multiple reaction things from the previous ones. All of that should be relatively um, approachable. It, there's just a lot of it. That's all. So how do we go about solving um, something like this? The problem statement, which I guess we don't have, uh, is solve for T and X. Right, that is our goal for this problem, is figure out what's the temperature of the reactor and what's the conversion inside the reactor. One way, for example, if this were to show up on, uh, for example, an exam, I think I said for example like three times right there, is to say set up but do not solve the equations, or uh, set up the equations and show that the degrees of freedom are zero. To show that the degrees of freedom are zero, you would show a big equation and indicate that there's one equation and one unknown, or two equations and two unknowns, something like that. And that could be sufficient for um, an exam. So if we just look up, if we just took the first part of that, right, if this were an exam type equation, or an exam type question, <clears throat> it could be something like show that the energy balance and the material balance have zero degrees of freedom. Uh-oh. iPad's starting to slow down. I hope it doesn't crash. What does a zero degrees of freedom mean? Uh, in the context that we're doing this, or that we're solving this, it's simply that the number of equations is equal to the number of unknowns, which is actually the same context that you would have used in like 100 when you learned about degrees of freedom analyses for unit operations. 
Same idea here, it's just we've only got two equations. We've got a material balance and we've got an energy balance. One way to do this is to just show that all of those equations have only that number of unknowns. Um, or you find all of them and find out there's only one unknown. All of those are, are good enough ways that you can show that given a calculator or enough time, I could solve this equation. So for example, the material balance that we've got is, remember, V for a CSTR uh, is equal to minus, or actually that's on the bottom, FA naught X over minus RA. So some of the problems here are okay. Uh, we know FA naught, we know V. We don't know X, but we're trying to solve for X, so we can leave X. Um, kind of alone at the moment. If we were to start working on this, we would need to come up with something for RA. Um, RA isn't too bad because it's an elementary rate law. So we would have RA is KCA naught times 1 minus X. That's X sub A. I'm just leaving off the sub A because there's only one of them. It's conversion of A. That's fine. Um, so we're getting closer, right? We've got a K and a CA naught. We can leave the X in there because that's one of the values we want to solve for. Um, so the material balance is now essentially a function of X. Um, if we rearrange that, we end up with X is 1 plus little v0 over volume times K to the minus 1. So I used that FA naught, or sorry, CA naught is equal to FA naught over V naught um, to simplify that a little bit. What do we mean when we say we know what K is? We kind of know what K is, except it is itself a function of temperature, right? It can vary with temperature. So we should probably elaborate what we mean by we know what K is. We know what K is in the sense that we know K is equal to some K ref times the exponential of Ea over Rt ref times 1 minus T ref over T. So here, this is obviously the first hint that we're going to need an energy balance, other than I gave you a bunch of energy balance information. Uh, we know what K ref is. That was given. Uh, Ea, R, and T ref are all okay. So is T ref over here. So we know all of those terms, but we're still stuck here with this T. All right? We don't know what that particular T is. So we've kind of got two unknowns, right? We've got an equation here, which is a function for X. X is unknown. But that by itself is actually a function of temperature because the K here has a temperature in it, if you look down in the other k over here. So this x that we've got is really some function of temperature. We, can all, we still haven't used our energy balance, right? The only equation that we've really used here in terms of equations that can solve things is the material balance. We still get the energy balance, though. So we have to write the energy balance. Uh, we do have a Q term, so our Q term, do I have enough room there? Yeah, that ought to be enough. Our Q term will look like minus UA T minus TA. Uh, if you look at your notes from the previous um, lecture, there would be that FA naught times the sum of the thetas times the CPs times the difference in temperatures. We've only got one thing that's actually present initially, so that simplifies quite a bit to FA0 times the heat capacity of A times T minus T0. I will just note on here, too, that this T0 is your inlet. We use T0 in another way for a plug flow or a pack bed, right? T0 for a plug flow or a pack bed is still your inlet, 
Um, but it also, for a batch reactor, I guess is the weird one. It's your initial temperature. Um, here it refers to your inlet temperature. And then the other remaining term that we have was, you could bring it up in a couple of different ways. Um, one of the ways that we saw was FA naught X times delta H. <laughs> Excuse me. You could do that either way, right? I think the other way was RA times V uh, is equal to FA naught X. There's a minus sign inside there somewhere. Either one of those would be fine. I'm going to go with the FA naught X because we've already got an expression for um, X. So if I look through these terms and try to figure out what do I know and what do I don't know, I know the U, I know the A because those were given to me. The TA is known. T is one of the variables I'm trying to solve for. And then the vast majority of the rest of this is also known. So FA naught was given, CPA was given, T naught was given. T is one of our variables, so we're not worried about that. FA naught's given. X is another one of our variables, so we're not worried about that. And delta H was given. So this could be one way that you could demonstrate to me, for example, on an exam, that there is enough information here and you know which equations you need in order to solve for this. So we have two equations. Our material balance. And the material balance is itself a function of x and t. And we have our energy balance, which is also a function of x and t. And we have exactly two unknowns. Those two unknowns are x and t. And those are the ones that we've been underlining with this little yellow bracket. You can circle them, square them, box them, star them, whatever you want. But at any rate, we've kind of demonstrated here that everything is known in these two equations except x and t. How we go about solving that can take um, a little bit more time. The only thing that I'm going to do right now, let's see, do I even have enough time to do that? We've only got six minutes. I'm going to set up the equation, um, but we're not going to solve it until tomorrow. Um, because we'll look at all those different techniques that we want. Here's the way that I'm going to solve this. I'm going to substitute our expression from x inside our energy balance up there. So we'll end up with 0 is equal to minus ua t minus ta. minus FA naught, oops, that's not a C, that's a C, heat capacity of A, T minus TA, minus FA naught. And so all I'm going to do is substitute that expression for um, conversion here, and it's 1 plus the little V0, which is our inlet volumetric flow rate, times V times the rate constant K. that entire quantity to the minus 1 times delta H. And then we're, of course, going to need that equation for K as a function of temperature, but we're going to solve this particular um, equation. The way that I'm going to do that, that I think we'll just probably finish lecture about now, we're going to plot this function. So we're going to define this as F of T. And we're going to plot f of t. So wherever that f of t happens to intersect the 0 line, if this is 0, it'll look just like that solution that we had at the beginning of the lecture when we were talking about just general math approaches. Wherever that intersection is, that's going to be our solution. And we'll have to take a look and see what the physical meaning is of each of those um, solutions. They're going to end up being a little bit weird. Um, which is what we will spend almost all of tomorrow talking about. What is the weirdness of these? The weirdness is that we will find what are called multiple steady states. 
So we can actually operate our reactor in one of several ways, um, simply from the parameters as given here for this particular reactor, which is real. Um, they're not like fake solutions or anything like that. You can really get multiple solutions for this, which was not possible with a plug flow or a pack bed reactor. Um, so that's the big difference here. Tomorrow we will elaborate on that particular solution, and then Friday we'll look at another example. Thank you all very much. I'll see you tomorrow.